The first time you did that goal was tough. Four times? I shot more fire. That's seven now. Welcome to the 908th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. And tonight's refreshments are being served by Chef Eileen. And Tom McDonough's got it next month, so we're good to go. We're in good hands this next couple of months. There'll be no food poisoning. So we're going to start with the Secretary's report and Phil Levine. Going to read the summary of the ATMA meeting held March 8, 2018, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics here in the Phillips Auditorium. Club President Glenn Chapel called the meeting to order at 8 p.m. Please refer to the Starfield's newsletter for details on the Secretary and Treasurer membership, observing clubhouse reports, as well as the newly established Telescope Making Committee and Outreach Committee reports. Announcements. Steve Clardy informed the membership that the club has finalized the purchase of the 25-inch Star Splitter Telescope from Steve Mark. Steve Clardy thanked Bernie Kozicki, Tom McDonough, and Maria Batista for their work organizing the sale of surplus club telescopes to the membership. Maria created the new bidding section on the Atmob website. Proceeds from the sale of surplus telescopes go to the club. April 21, is um, Astronomy Day at MIT Haystack in Westford. At mall, volunteers are needed. Um, old business, none. New business, none. Glenn Chapel introduced the guest speaker for the evening, Andrew Cheel, a graduate student in physics at Harvard University. The title of Andrew's talk, Imaging a Black Hole with the Event Horizon Telescope. Andrew presented an outline, a historical timeline of important discoveries leading to our current concept of black hole phenomenon. Black holes, though comparatively small in size, are thought to be very important in the structure, evolution, and formation of galaxies. Andrew discussed the Event Horizon Telescope, which consists of seven telescopes at various locations around the world. The EHT should provide the best view of a black hole by utilizing data in various wavelengths from the shadow region surrounding the black hole. Andrew discussed how the very long baseline interferometry array utilizing Fourier analysis of EHT data <laughs> will circumvent the diffraction-like limitations of traditional telescopes. Glenn Chapel adjourned the meeting at 9.45 p.m. So far. Speaking of fiction, we have the, com the observing committee report. Uh, what I did, by the way, because we have two new on, we got fired. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to look for somebody to officially do this. Uh, I kept this kind of short this time. I don't have all the slides because we have other committees to report, so things will appear in the newsletter. Um, the only thing I know is a noteworthy event is that Jupiter will be coming into uh, opposition next month. And you mentioned something about that uh, occultation of that asteroid, but it looks kind of iffy, right? Yeah, that's Monday night. I sent it out to the announce list. Um, if you, uh, it, it, weather looks really iffy. And if it yeah. doesn't, uh, everybody over Mario's out, we're gonna do it there. It's clear, right here, but it's right. Did anybody want to announce anything as far as rel relative observing? Anything you've been looking at lately or anything that's coming up for observing? Yes, uh, just uh, to, to the Lyric Meteors are coming up on the 22nd, I think, and they're supposed to be favorable because, you know, the moon won't be around. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, and you can stop me short if I said this before, but it was kind of funny. I, my grandmother passed away somewhere around 1983, I think it was, and I went outside not long afterwards, and I remember, I just, I do this sometimes if somebody kind of special passes, I'll just, you know, look up at the sky and I have my own thoughts and I saw a meteor zip by. And it looked like it was from the area of Lyra, I didn't think much about it. And then within a few minutes, another one. And then I just looked and I probably saw five in about a half hour. I didn't know there was a meteor shower in Lyra. And that was the Lyra meteor shower. And then in Guy Ottawell's book, a few years later, they mentioned it was an unusually a high period of activity for that particular shower. And I know the Romans always believed meteor showers announced the death of somebody special. So I even told my aunts and uncles, and they, they kind of felt good about that. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, John. <laughs> um, also, today is Yuri's night. What? 
Yuri, Yuri Knight. Uh, today is the day, uh, it's the anniversary of when Yuri Gagarin oh. first circled the Earth, the first human in orbit. Wow. I'm celebrating with wild orgies, John. Is that right? <laughs> My house later. No martyrs. <laughs> Let's get on. Uh, Steve isn't here for the clubhouse report, so John's going to let us know what's going on. I'll just holler from back here. Okay, there were three work parties in March. Two planned, and then the March 17th snowstorm. Well, we, we enjoyed the three 19-inch market basket pizzas that kept us going. We went right back out after that and got all the pads and everything clear. There were a total of 60 members volunteer for those three events. That's, that's a nice hefty number and that's the only way we can keep the clubhouse moving. The next work party will be April 28th. <coughs> We'll continue, well, some of the stuff we finished, we made more space in the far barn, so we'll get, there's a possibility we'll be getting a little bit better equipment for mowing and for snow plowing. If we do, there'll be room for it to park. A lot of work on the roll-off roof mm -hmm. observatory there on the left of the picture. Uh, John Marr has, with the help of Dave Broughton and many others, has this winch system set up so that no longer will ice clog the steel wheels so that at 2 a.m. in the morning a lone person or two people might not be able to pull with the handles that are provided now. With this winch, it'll break the ice. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. So this uh, April 28th work party, we switched from the winter menu of Bailey Hill spaghetti sauce and fried chicken and garlic bread. And we go back to burgers and dogs from the grill. <laughs> <laughs> See you there. Hey, thank you. Uh, telescope Maker Committee, I have something that Mike Madison listed. Did you have anything, Tom, at all? We don't really have an official spokesperson yet for the Telescope Maker Committee. So Mike had sent out an email, and I'll just read what he had. Uh, the mirror table and test tunnel is finished, thanks to Barry Jennings, it is working well now. A double thanks to Bruce Berger, who gave the club a laser interferometer. Bruce, stand up just a little. There we are. It didn't have a power supply, so I took it home three weeks ago and sent an email to Malis Roy, I guess that's the name, asking about a power supply. The answer that came back was, we don't make those power supplies anymore. Then he indicated that the center post on the back of the laser is negative. I sent this info to Bruce. Bruce came back with, I have a power supply that will work, just need to rewire it. Now we have a working laser and interferometer for the club balls. All we need to do is set up and test it. So that's what's going on with the mirror making right now. And again, we do appreciate uh, the work those folks are doing in that group. Well, I was going to add, go, go back one, go back to that slide. Uh, that middle picture, you're looking at the most patient teenager in the Oh, oh yeah. Um, she did some recalculations. Um, I, as you can see, Mike is helping her pour a pitch lot there. But prior to that, she had done some calculations and realized that she'd been grinding for the last couple of years, and her um, her mirror is actually an F3 um, oh. due to a calculation error. Um, and I, I was surprised to see her come back. She was all happy. I said, what are you going to do? She said, well, I'm going to keep pressing onward. And I was like, well, that's awesome. You know, so that's what she's going to do. Right, she's not turning into an ashtray, then it's going to be an actual mirror. No, she's going to actually make a mirror. She's going to make a nice F3. But she's going to, she's going to, she's going to keep it fast. I said, you know, you've been grinding for two years. You're an expert. Just flip it over, throw some 80 grit back on there and have that. I said, I'll do the first stroke if you want to get it started. <laughs> you know, you're afraid to go mess up your mirror. I'll just, I'll do it for you. <laughs> she's, she's going to press forward. So that's probably that you got an eight inch? Yes, yes. And we do want to know when anybody in the club finishes a mirror, let us know so we can announce it at the meeting. Uh, outreach committee. Oh, it's my turn. Go ahead, Mitch. Yeah. All right, hi, everybody. Well, um, um, I promised I would keep this to oh, about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So we've done some star parties. Um, Glenn, you were talking about a, a star party up in Litchfield, New Hampshire. Did you get that one? Did you do that one? Which one? On March 20th, Campbell High School? Oh, no. I'll, that one's been rescheduled. Oh, OK. Be for me. Um, Tom, uh, you want to talk about the Chenery School sure. for a second? So Chenery Middle, Middle School is uh, March 22nd, so it was after the time change. 
we had to stay a little later to get a little dark, and we had to pray to the weather gods to even get any kind of uh, observing done at all. I, I was the first one out with my old telescope, and we did were able to see the moon through the, through the clouds. And the kids got to see some of it. But we had um, a number of participants from the club, and forgive me if I've left anyone out, we had um, Corey Mooney, and Corey's, you're here, right? Yep. Yeah. So Corey has a nice little telescope he's building, and he's, and he's working on automating it, so if you're at a telescope party, uh, a, a star party, check it out. It's really, really cool. Um, Rich Nugent, obviously, was there. Bob Finney and uh, Bob Toop. And did I forget anyone else um, that was at the party? Which star party was that? This is Chenery oh. in Belmont. Yeah. So, I six great party. party. Overall, uh, the group was, was fantastic. Ben Ligon, he's the science teacher there, it was really great. They had pizza and drinks for us. It's a great star party, inner city kind of, because there's a lot of light pollution, but always fun and the kids are great. So next year, check it out, okay? If you read my little summary in the, the uh, star fields, that, that's the one where Bob Finney brought that life-size robotic R2-D2 unit. <laughs> that's tough to compete with, let me tell you. We should get one of those. Where's that lean? We should buy one of those. <laughs> They're not um, cheap. Life size, right? And the robotic and radio control. It was pretty cool. I wanted to put a restraining bolt on the little thing. Because. Just one? Sure. Yes. Get a yes. tell. 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 <laughs> um, I was in Chicago, but there was a, allegedly a, a star party at the Lincoln School in Brookline, but I don't have much information about that. Future events, Astronomy Day at Haystack. Glenn's going to be there. That's the Neve weekend. Um, that, that's a Saturday. On the Sunday, the CFA, um, uh, John, you've got something going on at CFA that night. Yeah. Um, we uh, The CFA is having its usual Cambridge um, Cambridge Science Festival event they have every year on um, on Sunday the 22nd. I know that's Neef weekend. That, that's from a daytime event from 12 to 4. But we are having a star party afterwards, same day, up here in a roof uh, from 8 to 10. Hopefully the weather will cooperate and we do need some help. And when does, when does this whole festival happen? Okay. Uh, the whole festival. Um, it's usually it's a week. In the book. Yeah. It's, it's in the book. Next week or it's, <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the book on the back table. There you go. It's the, it's the 13th through the 22nd. Okay. Tomorrow. Have a week tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. Starts tomorrow. And then I've got one of the star party at Waits Mountain in Walden. Um, that's a pretty good one. I did that a, a long time ago. And Noreen Grice, uh, who was formerly at the Museum of Science, was putting that on. That's on the 19th of May. Um, we had a Girl Scout group up at the clubhouse. I think it was the Saturday the 24th. Um, Chris uh, Elledge uh, hosted those folks. Uh, they spent most of their time in the roll-off, so they got to look through the 16-inch and the newly acquired 25-inch scope. So they were, they were not dressed for the cold, but they hung in there. They did a pretty good job. They were troopers. And um, the Groton Community uh, Center, uh, uh, Bob Toop and uh, John Stodiak uh, had a group uh, on the clubhouse on Thursday the 5th of uh, of April. Um, I got to talk to those folks on the 2nd. Uh, I showed them my satellite presentation. Um, Glenn was going to talk to the folks at the Southern Star Astronomy Convention in North Carolina, but you've seen that Domino's commercial where the tree falls on the guy's car? Hmm. That was him. Um, <laughs> what else? Pop Scope. Uh, there was an event on the April 6th that uh, got brought indoors, and apparently there's another one in Rosaldale on the 5th of May. So that's all I've got for outreach right now, except to say that if you, any of this uh, sounds interesting to you. Um, you can always use volunteers and we look forward to people helping out and uh, it's gratifying and it's, you don't get paid for it, but sometimes they offer chili or pizza or, you know, whatever. So just see me or one of the Star Party coordinators. Are um, they listed on the calendar? Um, some of this stuff is on there. I'll make sure the rest of it gets put on. <laughs> awesome. Any questions? All right, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, last year, no sooner had I agreed to give a talk at the Southern Star Convention than I found out I had a heart condition, so I had to cancel. This time a tree came down the driveway two hours before I was going to leave, so I'm kind of afraid to commit to doing it next year. <laughs> while, I'm, quit while I'm ahead. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, announcements. Astronomy Day is the 21st. I'll put something out. I've been working with Haystack on this. And um, they've been very cooperative. They have an event, I can't think of the name of that, what sign up now, event? 
event break. Right? Okay. An event break, right, yeah, they're setting up a, one of those. They've already had a few people from Haystack. I opened it to them first. What I want to do now is open it up to some of the communities in the Haystack area, Groton, Littleton, so forth. I had hoped to have a flyer and have some of you go to your local library and put that there, but I couldn't get all the information in time, so I'll send something out via email because that's the Saturday coming up. We're going to be giving a talk about getting into uh, amateur astronomy, and then I'll, uh, I'll look, we'll look for some volunteers from the club to set up telescopes outside. I'm also going to encourage everybody to bring binoculars because a lot of people don't realize what you can see with binoculars. So I'll put something out. That's going to be coming up uh, a week from Saturday. Hopefully we'll get a good turnout. Oh, I had a couple of announcements very quickly. I said, uh, these all came in after I'd sent things to, uh, um, to Al. Uh, Aaron Slisky, where's Aaron? Okay. There you go. You just want to mention, you want to bring some uh, pieces of equipment sure. next time? Uh, the Smithsonian has donated a bunch, well, I helped clean out the closets here at the Smithsonian, and so there's <laughs> a bunch of random stuff, including a brand new STV auto guider that will be donated to the club, and uh, the money will go towards the club. And we'll, we'll have it next week because there was a mishap, but. Next week that'll be here. Okay, next, next month. month. Next month, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, there was some chatter going on about the eclipse in 2019, but that was on the end. Just to let you know, there's still some talk about how that's going to go through. Sky and Tell is doing something, right? Yeah, um, the, uh, we actually have a ground tour, uh, which uh, uh, is in the only five-star resort along the path of totality, so you can, you know, <coughs> focus your scope with one hand and have a nice, you know, like uh, Pisco Sour in the other. Uh, I, I know some of you saw an announcement by uh, Glenn Schneider about a plane that he's going to charter from mm -hmm. Easter Island. You are the first to know that Sky and Telescope has a charter plane. Uh, we'll be announcing it. it. It is not going to be going from Easter Island. It'll be going from Santiago be about half the cost of what Glenn's is, so stay tuned. And while I have your attention, I also want to announce that I am now officially, after, 40, after 43 years, mostly not working full-time at Sky and Telescope anymore, right? <laughs> quasi-retired, so. You did a great job. Okay, uh, Stella Kafka put out something again, you all heard, there is a March for Science on Saturday, so again, check your email, look into that if you're interested in uh, going to do that. Uh, I've been hearing from Michael O'Shea about something called Astronomy on Tap, and there was also an email out about that. It's also mentioned in this brochure, Cambridge Science Festival. It's on uh, Tuesday, Tuesday the 17th, 6 to 8 p.m. at a place called uh, The Burn, I guess is the name of it, but it's oh, also yeah. mentioned in here. Somebody knows where that is? <laughs> It's one of those things where when you first go in, you see single stars and you leave, they're all double stars, so it's kind of a nice <laughs> bed for you. The food is good though. Double, double. They have good food there. And by the way, again, I don't want to drag out the meeting. We're doing pretty well, but um, this is something I think, and I'll kick myself for this, but I've been focused so much on that thing at Haystack. I didn't think about this. We should get into this next year, maybe. So we'll be looking for that. If we even had some type of a talk here about getting, what the one I'm doing at Haystack is getting interested or getting into backyard astronomy, that'd be a great presentation. And we'd also just set up things at different malls and so forth. But that's for next year. Acadian Night Sky Festival. I just was announced that that's going to be September uh, 5th to 9th. And that's about it. Anybody have anything else to add here? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to uh, announce we have, uh, I think it's our fifth annual uh, Maine Astronomy Retreat mm -hmm. and Symposium up in Washington, Maine. Which really Kelly's nice working with, too. Something that Kelly Beattie and I have been putting on, and we've been doing astronomy up there for, I don't know, Kelly's probably on, what, 12 years or something like that? And uh, the sky's really dark. It is a star party like no other. Uh, you have a private cabin, free home-cooked meals a day. It's the only star party that I know of that lobster is part of the entry fee, lobster dinner. So. Uh, We'll be up. We'll have a booth at Nice. I'll be there. The dates are August 11th through 17th. Thank you very much. I was planning to go up, by the way, and was I just about to say I would do it. Clouds started to gather over my house, and my pacemaker started to fail. So we'll hold up on that. But it looks like it'd be a nice event to get to. You had something, Mario? Yeah. Just uh, Ellie can chime in. The update on the line bill. I Usually it's pessimistic and didn't get passed on its own. It's stuck in uh, a four ways of means. But uh, Bruce Carr 
is trying to get it moved to the budget uh, which has to pass. And you said Garibaldi's trying to do the same on the House side. In the past, we tried that, and it always fails because unless it's this, if the bills are identical, our illustrious legislators who work only 10 minutes a year, mm -hmm. and at the end of the year when the two bills are different, you know, rather than actually working it out, they'll just strip anything that's not the same. So if it's on both sides, there's actually a chance it might sail through because there's actually no opposition. So that's actually encouraging. In addition, um, in February, I debated the head of the IES in California, um, and I was amazed at how little he knew about lighting. This is the guy who does the standards for the streets. Um, and his big moment was, he kept trying to poke holes in the AMA report. Uh, his big moment was, are you going to, uh, 4,000 K allows you to see better down the street than 3,000 K. It by a couple of feet in the study. Yeah, are you going to take, uh, is the AMA going to take responsibility, he said this in a loud voice in the audience, uh, for all the debts that will occur because of lack of vision. <laughs> So I looked at him and af after the moderator uh, berated him for that stupid comment, I looked at him and said, I don't know, will the IES take responsibility for all the debts that occurred at 2200 that you pushed for the last 30 years? He just looked. <laughs> but the good news that came, because of that, I got invited to the IES and spoke at their roads committee. And there were 60 members of the committee, there was a few online. What amazed me is how few of the committee members knew anything about the report. Okay, they were relying on the leadership to tell them what to do, and the leadership is being paid off by the, it's pretty clear, by the lighting companies. Huh. Most of them had never been exposed to the data, had no idea until it was presented. And at the end of the meeting, they all said, actually, that's not a bad idea. So the good thing that came out of it is they set up a subcommittee, and they're going to, and uh, the really good thing is uh, Ronald Gibbons from Virginia Tech, who is one of the few really good lighting engineer researchers. He's always been promoting 3000K, except for he said for a couple of select applications. Knowing he's on the subcommittee, there's actually a chance the IES may completely uh, change their stance, but we'll have to wait a couple of uh, months. Um, it was kind of funny because I said, we're still fighting about 3000, 4000. And I showed all the cities that went 3000 or lower, and Toronto was the last one. The RFD specifically stated they want to be AMA compliant. So I just looked at uh, this Mr. Leibel, who's the head of the committee, and said, uh, notice they said AMA compliant and they don't care about the IS. <laughs> Give it up already. <laughs> Go to lunch of that test satellite. Oh yeah, yeah I'm going to go down and see the test satellite take off uh, Monday night, and uh, hopefully get good pictures. We should get uh, uh, George uh, Ricker come give us a talk in the fall since he designed the satellite. He's right here at MIT, and he already said he would. So once it's up and running, uh, we'll have some pictures of the launch, and he can talk about the satellite. Great, thank you. Uh, it's launching from Vandenberg. No, no. Well, oh, it can, takes an hour. Okay. I got a VIP pass. <laughs> uh, PINs update. We've been talking about having an app model. Can there'll be more about that? I want to keep the business meeting going as much as I can. Bruce and Eileen have been on that, and we will keep you posted as we find out more. Uh, Meredith Ruman, that was a young BU student that came in a couple of months ago. Ben, was at one of our meetings? Interviewed some of us and went to the clubhouse, and her. Uh, her report, her article is finally out, and I did forward what she sent me online, so I just looked for an email, and she did a very nice job of covering the clubhouse, taking pictures at the meeting, and so forth, so you might want to check that out. Uh, does anybody have any new business to discuss? Right now, I guess speaker, and while they're getting set up, I'll read the bio. Uh, tonight's guest speaker is Dr. Mark Reed, who received his PhD in astronomy and planetary science from the California Institute of Technology in 1975, and is currently a senior astronomer at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He is a world leader in the development of the technique of very long baseline interferometry and is widely recognized as the father of ultra high precision radio astronomy. Reed worked on a wide variety of astrophysics topics from the formation and evolution of stars to black holes to the structure of the Milky Way. He has received numerous awards. 
including a senior award from the Alexander von Humboldt Society, the Beatrice Tinsley Surprise for the American Astronomical Society, and the Jansky Prize uh, Lectureship of Associated Universities Incorporated. Tonight, Dr. Reed will present new results on parallaxes and motions of star-forming regions from the Bessel survey, which addressed the nature of the spiral structure, size, rotation, speed, and mass of the Milky Way. Are we set to go? Yeah, just throw it in my pocket. Okay. Almost set. Okay, Dr. Reed. Okay. Voila. There we go. Okay, well, very happy to be here. Um, I work across the street, actually, in the, in the building over there, at 160 Concrete. And we're getting away from something. And I'm going to talk to you about what I've been spending, I would say, the last 10, 15 years on, um, which is trying to map the Milky Way. But I'm going to do this in a sort of historical manner, because it's a fascinating story, I think, um, about how astronomers have learned to measure distance over thousands of years. And then I'll end up with basically how, how we can do it today to much higher accuracy, of course. And, uh, so, I've got a picture on the background of this title slide. <clears throat> um, it's, a, it's a very modern picture of the sky. It's from the Hubble Deep Field, Hubble Space Telescope. And if you were to show this picture to astronomers from 100 years ago, so that's 1910s, around 1920, um, and if you ask them some really basic questions, for example, what are these things? Okay. How far away are any of them? They, they would have no way to answer that, even just 100 years ago. And that's, that's because measuring distance in astronomy is quite hard. <clears throat> so the first real measurement of distance in astronomy comes from Hipparchus in 189 BC, and he actually measured the distance to the moon. Kind of an amazing thing to do at that time. And basically, what he was able to do uh, was triangulate based on a, a solar eclipse. And so there was a solar eclipse, where is my pointer? So a total eclipse of the sun that was seen in the Mediterranean, and it was a total eclipse in Hellespont in modern day Turkey, but it was only an 80% eclipse in Alexandria in Egypt. And using only that information, he was able to measure the distance to the moon. And so basically, he probably drew a, a diagram, something like this, maybe in the sand. So here you have the Earth on the left, H for Hellespont, A for Alexandria. Uh, the moon gets in the exact right configuration of the total eclipse of the sun. So the ray path from Hellespont through the limb of the moon hits the limb of the sun on both sides. Of course, in Alexandria, being an 80% eclipse, it doesn't quite make it. You see the green lines missing the sun a little bit, so you get 80% coverage. And so you basically have a triangle from the limb of the moon, M here, up to Hellespont, down to Alexandria, and back. And there's an angle there, and that angle is essentially what was uncovered here in the sun. 20% of the sun, the sun is a half degree across, the tenth of one degree. And so if you just expand that triangle down here, uh, if you know the distance between Alexandria and Hellespont, and can do a little bit of a geometric correction here to get the projected distance, uh, and you know this angle, then you know the distance to the moon. Very simple formula. And so if you put the numbers in, you get about 400,000 kilometers, which is a pretty good estimate for the distance to the moon. Now, the moon is, of course, very close. And so, viewing it from two different points, which is essentially a parallax measurement, uh, is, is really you know, pretty easy. Um, if you went, uh, for example, in no Northern Europe and observed at the same time and in Cape Town, South Africa, 
that's about a 7,000 kilometer differing, differing vantage points. This is about how the moon would appear to look from the two sites. So it would move a lot, about two lunar diameters, about a degree. So, while well, Hipparchus was able to do this in about 189 BC, measure the distance of the moon, it was a long time before any other distances were measured in astronomy. There was also some other big issues in astronomy. Uh, basically, what, did the Earth go around the sun, a geocentric, sorry, did the sun go around the Earth, a geocentric cosmology, or did the Earth go around the sun, heliocentric cosmology? <coughs> And our friend Hipparchus, who measured the distance of the moon, was one of many famous people who believed basically what you see when you go outside, that everything just goes around us. But even in about 250 BC, Aristarchus of Samos uh, forwarded a heliocentric cosmology with the Earth going around the sun. But it took uh, nearly 2,000 years for this to be adopted, and why was that? Basically, you needed a very good test. What's a clear test of the differences in the cosmologies? And the clear test would be measuring a trigonometric parallax uh, to a star. So, if the sun is over here, and if the Earth goes around the sun once a year, if you view a nearby star against background stars that are much further away, uh, you will see it apparently change in position because you have a different vantage point. And if you want to try this yourself, put your finger up and, and blink your eyes back and forth with, and you'll see that if you view, view with your right eye or your left eye, your finger is going to appear to move because you're viewing it from a different angle. And so if you could measure that angle, uh, first of all, you could prove that the Earth went around the Sun and not the other way around. For example, if this were the Earth, and the sun were going around the earth, then there would be no change in the position of the star. So by making one measurement, measuring the parallax of one star, you have the opportunity to answer two of the biggest scientific questions of all time. The first question is how far away are the stars, which back then was how big is the universe, basically. And you could decide between a heliocentric and a geocentric cosmology. One measurement. Of course, it's a hard measurement to do. Um, I'll give you some numbers here. Uh, this angle, P, uh, for the nearest stars at a distance of one parsec is one arc second. If you go to the center of the Milky Way, for example, try to measure the parallax of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, uh, it's about 10,000 parsecs away, roughly. And so the parallax, that angle, the shift over one year is one-tenth of one thousandth <coughs> of an arc second, 0.1 milli arc seconds. And if you wanted to actually measure the parallax to other galaxies, even nearby galaxies like Andromeda, which are at about to make a parsec distance, uh, you have to measure one micro arc second, very, very small angle. Yeah? So the telescope for astronomy wasn't really invented until about 1600, but... Right. These proofs were done before then. How were they done without a telescope measuring such? No, no, none of these have been done. No, they were done. The first stellar parallax, which I'll get to shortly, was 1838. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, you need a telescope for it. Okay. The moon, you can do. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, so since you can answer these two fundamental questions of science with one measurement, it really every scientist for a thousand years tried to do it, basically. And there's a great book, I don't know if Alan Hirschfeld is here, he's gonna to talk to you at some point, I guess, in the future, next month. Next month. So it's a book by Alan Hirschfeld called Parallax, The Race to Measure the Cosmos. And I have a lot of material in here from that book. It's a fantastic book. If you like science books and astronomy books, uh, I encourage you to go get it. It's out of print, but you can go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble online and you can get it for a copy for a few bucks. <laughs> I bought about seven, I think. <laughs> People come over to my house and I say, this is a great book, and they start reading it and it vanishes. <laughs> okay, so the story of measuring parallax. Let's start with Robert Hooke. 
okay, and, and this is in the late 1600s. Um, and Robert Hooke was kind of an amazing guy, lived in London. Uh, he was the curator of uh, experiments for the Royal Society when the Royal Society started. And he, so he was a sort of a jack of all trades in science. He was a biologist. He basically invented the microscope and, and first use of it. He was well known in physics for Hooke's law, for how springs work. Uh, he was an astronomer, which I'll get to. He was the surveyor of London, and he was the first president of the Royal Society. So he tried to measure parallax. And he recognized immediately that a big problem would be atmospheric refraction. So if you're looking at a sunset or a sunrise, and when, when the sun either just has just gone down or just coming up, let's, let's take a, a, a sunset here. So the sun is going down. It's already set. The light from the sun comes through the Earth's atmosphere, gets bent, and it gets bent by about a half a degree, about the size of the sun. So when it's just sitting just below the horizon, uh, sorry, where it just appears to be just on the horizon, it's actually below the horizon. So it's a really big effect, a half a, half a degree. So if you're trying to measure positions of stars, and you know, we now know you have to measure arc seconds, um, and you have a half a degree problem, that, that's severe. And he recognized this was a big problem. And so what he did is he built a telescope, I think it was in his mother's house in London, and he put a hole in the roof and made a, tel a vertical telescope in London that would, would go all the way from the roof down to the basement. That's going to be Mario's next project. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at a star, Gamma Draconis, that goes dead overhead in, in London. And basically he hung some plumb bobs to get a vertical, and then he would tilt his telescope until he got the star exactly centered and measured against the plumb bob. And he did this in uh, um, July of 1669. And then he did it again uh, a few months later. And we don't really have any records of his results. He probably detected a difference, but we don't really know. He had many problems with this. Uh, apparently the house was moving a little bit and the telescope had problems. And at this point, he was not in good health, and he sort of quit the project. Now, I'm going to try to show uh, pictures of, of people here. There is no known uh, um, portrait of Robert Hooke, even though he's quite a famous guy. This is a sort of a synthesized portrait based on descriptions of him. And it's an interesting thing, because there are portraits of all the presidents of the Royal Society but apparently they moved offices a bit after Robert Hooke well, was not the president anymore. And during that move, presumably there was a, po a portrait, and presumably it was lost. And it was probably because of this man, <laughs> Isaac Newton, who was the second president of the Royal Society. And these two did not get along at all. <laughs> they fought each other. Uh, Isaac Newton was quite upset because uh, Hooke claimed to to uh, have, have discovered the inverse square law of gravity, and, and many other things. So it's an interesting thing that professional jealousies went way back. <laughs> OK, let's move on to James Bradley. So in about 1750, nearly 100 years after Hooke, he tried to reproduce Hooke's observations, build a vertical telescope to look at gamma draconis. And this is probably what he was looking to see. This would be the parallax effect. So this is the shift in declination. And these are in 10, 20 arc second units on this plot. And here's about a year going across in the 1700s. So he was expecting a shape like this. As the Earth goes around the sun, you view this from a different vantage point. You see the source appear to move essentially down and then up over the year in a nice sinusoidal fashion. Here's what he saw. This is his real data. Uh, now, by the way, he didn't know how the, what the amplitude of that red line was. Okay, that, that amplitude uh, was the parallax, and that would tell you the distance, and he didn't know the distance. So this is what he saw. Beautiful sinusoidal data. He's got very nice data, sort of arc second accuracy. Uh, the problem was it shifted by about three months 
from where it should be. We seem to know where the Earth was going around the sun. And he really didn't understand what was happening here at the beginning. He thought maybe there's something wrong with this telescope. So he built a new telescope, tried it again, got the same result. So he tried a different star, did it again, got about the same result. And the story goes that, you know, after years of trying to understand this data, he was uh, sailing and he was looking at the little telltale flag on the top of a mast and he noticed that every time the sailboat tacked, the flag would move. And he thought about it a bit and he said, well, if the wind can affect, the motion of the boat can affect the apparent position of the wind, maybe the motion of the earth can affect the apparent direction which light comes to us from. And that's called aberration of light. So he correctly discovered uh, that effect. Um, he never had a chance of measuring the parallax of Gamma Draconis. Uh, he put an upper limit of about one half of an arc second for the parallax angle, which meant it was more than about two parsecs away, or six light years. The true parallax we now know for this star is two one hundredths of an arc second. And that's shown in this dashed line, but you know, there's no way you can see it. <laughs> and if you think you see it, I think it's an optical illusion because your eye gets guided by this uh, other line here. Hmm? How did you get that data? Oh, yeah, well that, this is, this is aberration, this is um, aberration of light. So what it is is that when the Earth is moving sideways with respect to the, the source, it, the way to think about it is aberration is, let's say the, the analogy is if you're trying to catch rain in, in a can, okay, and if, if the rain is coming straight down and you hold the can straight up, you'll catch the most. But now if you start moving at, at a substantial speed, you sort of have to tip the can because the rain's gonna be coming in at an angle because you're moving. And this is because the Earth is moving. It's a 20 arc second effect. Light is bent by 20 arc seconds. You have to tilt your telescope by 20 arc seconds to get it all to come in. <laughs> Pretty good for 1700s. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. This is, I think, probably the most fascinating part of the parallax story. It's Joseph Fraunhofer in the 1800s and this is just an amazing story of chance and talent. He was uh, one of 11 children in a very poor family. And uh, the, the family, uh, um, uh, his father made glass for windows. And at one point his mother fell down the stairs and died. And a year later his father died, so the, all, all 11 children were orphaned. This is in the Munich area, Germany. And so he was, all the kids were sent, you know, to various places. He was apprenticed to a mirror maker because he knew a little bit about working with glass. Now, the mirror maker was supposed to allow him to go to school one day a week, but didn't let him go. He had absolutely no education. And uh, when he was uh, about 13 years old, he was working in the mirror maker's house, which was a four-story building in Munich, and the building collapsed. It killed the mirror maker's wife, uh, and Fraunhofer, luckily, was near some shipping containers for the, for the mirrors that held up the debris, and he wasn't killed. Well, this was a big deal in Munich, and uh, the Munich's prince, Maximilian Joseph, came down to oversee the rescue efforts because they could hear young Fraunhofer calling for help. And after a few hours, they managed to dig him out. And at this point, the, the prince took an interest in him. Uh, at some point, he gave him some books so he could educate himself, and finally gave him some money to buy himself out of the contract and indentured servitude uh, with the mirror maker. Uh, Fraunhofer started a business at that point, printing business cards that failed luckily for astronomy. <laughs> and then he went and worked with uh, a lens maker a really accomplished lens maker in the Munich area. And he learned the business very well, and uh, he ultimately became uh, the best optician in the world, made the best telescopes in the world. 
And in fact, here's a picture of one I found on eBay a couple years ago. This is a Fraunhofer telescope that was for sale. There was no price on it. <laughs> but wow, I mean, to be able to, if you could get a Fraunhofer telescope, apparently they were spectacularly well made. Um, so he's basically the best tel telescope maker in the world at that point. He's also uh, discovered Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum by putting a prism in, in front of the telescope. Uh, so a very famous guy, very accomplished. Died very young, he was only 39 years old. Probably died of tuberculosis. Anyway, his last two telescopes went to people who wanted to measure parallax. And one of them is a long name there, Friedrich Georg Wilhelm von Struve. And he used Fraunhofer's 9.5 inch re refractor with a micrometer eyepiece to try to measure the parallax of Vega. And it's an interesting story. So in 1836, he told people he had a tentative detection of a parallax and that the parallax was one eighth of one arc second for Vega. Now he didn't have a lot of data and he said he wasn't positive about it, but he showed it to everybody. One of the people he showed it to was Bessel, Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel. Okay, and he used Fraunhofer's last telescope to try to measure parallax also. Now he was observing, um, von Struve was observing Vega, a very bright star, right? You're probably familiar with it. In the hopes that if it's bright, it's nearby. Uh, Bessel used a different approach. He was, wanted to observe a fairly weak star. It's actually a double star system called 61 Cygni. Um, they're both K-type stars, uh, about fifth magnitude, with about a 30 arc second separation. And he chose these because these had, this, this star, this double star, had a very high proper motion, about five arc seconds per year. It was called Piazzi's flying star. And he figured if it's moving quickly across the sky, it's probably because it's close. That was a good bet. Okay, so he observed uh, 61 Cygni against two background stars, star A down here, about a tenth magnitude star, and another star over here. So these are separated by 13, uh, 0.13 degrees and 0.2 degrees, a fifth of a degree. He measured essentially the lengths of those arrows as a function of time over the year. Now, he knew that Struve was onto this and that he was gonna have a good result within about a year also. And he'd been wanting to do this for many years. So he spent about every clear night for a year measuring the, the parallax effect. And here's his data. So what's plotted here is the <coughs> angular offset vertically as a function of time over one year. 1837 and a half to about 1838 and a half over here. The scale is small now. Uh, each little tick mark is one tenth of one arc second. And so here's all his data for, for the angular separation between uh, star A and 61 Cygni as a function of time over a year. And here's the same type of data for star B. It's different because of the different orientations of these two stars. Well, I have fitted his data to see what, how good it was. And uh, the parallax you get from the star A measurement is 0.37 arc seconds with an uncertainty of about 10%. And for star B, you get about a quarter of an arc second, 0.26, with about the same uncertainty. Now he essentially averaged those two results together and got this parallax, 0.31 arc seconds, and the, the correct value, the modern day, very accurate value, good to a milli arc second here, is 0.287. So you can see he did a good job on this. Now, I can't imagine how you can analyze that data, all that data, without a computer. <laughs> There are a lot of calculations that go into doing a least square fit on that volume of data. So he, you know, must have been months of calculations and you gotta get it right. When was, when was uh, Gauss, because Gauss invented these squares? 
Uh, that was about the same time. I think it's similar, yeah. Yeah, Gauss's method, you know, yeah. Yeah, is well known for least squares. You could probably fit in many other ways, but I, I think he must have done a, a true least squares fit because averaging those two uh, sure. results gives you that. Wow. So he did it right. Okay, so this convinced people that, that someone finally, after 2,000 years, measured a distance to a star. So the distance to the star was, if you just invert that number, you get about three parsecs, about six light years for the star. He became very famous from the, in this measurement. Um, let's go back just to finish this story about Friedrich von Struve. This is his data. All this data is published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, and, and so it's great. You can get it and you can try to fit it. So I, I tried fitting Struve, uh, von Struve's data. He, by the way, after that extra year of data, it looks a little noisy there, but if you average it, you, you get a real detection. He, he said, after, after Bessel announced his result, he said the parallax to Vega is a quarter of an arc second, not being one eighth of an arc second. He tentatively had said the year before. So I fit his data, and indeed, you get a quarter of an arc second when you fit this data. The interesting thing is if you fit only the first year's data here, you also get a quarter of an arc second. Now he had originally said an eighth of an arc second, so I'm sure he did some calibration change uh, over the whole time and tried to improve it. Probably having to do with temperature corrections when you make these measurements. The temperature moves things around. I think in part because he changed from one eighth to a quarter of an arc second, uh, that didn't give a lot of confidence to his original result, which would have had the highest priority as being the first result. So von Struve doesn't get as much credit as Bessel for measuring the first stellar parallax. Ironically, uh, the distance, the parallax of Vega is one eighth of one arc second, and not a quarter of an arc second. So he had it right at the beginning. Okay, well, if we skip forward, you know, uh, couple hundred years over measuring parallaxes with optical plates. Uh, there was this space telescope that the Europeans launched called Hipparchos for high precision parallax collecting satellite in honor of Hipparchus who measured the parallax to the moon. And it measured parallaxes for about 100,000 stars. And the accuracy, the uncertainty in the parallax measurement was about one one thousandth of an arc second for all those stars. So that gives you about a 10% accurate distance to stars at a 100 parsec distance. Now, 100 parsecs is not all that far. It's sort of called the solar neighborhood. So keep that in mind. But it really mapped the solar neighborhood really well. OK. Uh, Gaia, if you've heard, is the successor to Parcos. It's a telescope in space launched a few years ago. It's uh, aim is to measure one billion, there's a nine there, one billion star stellar parallaxes with much higher accuracy, about 20 micro arc seconds, about 50 times higher accuracy. It will be a truly astounding mission when it completes. And in fact, they're gonna have their second data release, which will have some real parallaxes in a, in a week or so. Okay, but I'm not here to talk about Gaia, I'm here to talk about what we can do and have done recently with radio astronomy. And so you've had a talk apparently about the Event Horizon Telescope last month, is that it? Okay, that's the same technique here. It's called Very Long Baseline Interferometry. It was developed in the late 60s. Uh, and basically you take radio telescopes, uh, pictured here, uh, spread across the United States. This is called the Very Long Baseline Array. It's 10 telescopes dedicated to this technique. And the really good thing about this is that you can combine the signals you receive from all 10 uh, telescopes. And you can synthesize a telescope that has the same angular resolution as a radio telescope essentially the size of the Earth. So you get a lot of angular resolution. The other good thing about radio waves, especially if you want to try to map the Milky Way, is you can see right through all the dust in the Milky Way. Basically, optically, you can only see you know, roughly a quarter of the way to the center of the Milky Way. 
the light beyond that from stars is just totally absorbed by, by all the dust in the Milky Way. Okay, let me give you some numbers here, what you can do. So, for example, the human eye has about 40 arc second angular resolution. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope can do about 0 0.055 one hundredths of an arc second. And this array can get down to a, about one milli arc second imaging. You can get resolved spots of one milli arc second with this. And that just tells you, you know, how, how well you can, for example, separate two bright spots. If they're a milli arc second apart, you could, you could separate them. You could tell they were two spots. But you can actually measure positions much better than that resolution. And basically, we've been able to achieve that accuracy, the measuring position, position differences between background quasars and some target we're looking at in the Milky Way. That's 10, 10 micro arc seconds, 0 0.00001 arc seconds. OK, well, with that, you can do a lot. So let me just show you a bit about what parallax data looks like that we use, because I'm going to show you some examples. So this is all hypothetical on this slide. Uh, let's look at the left slide. This is the sky. So we have north upward and east to the left. I've got negative signs there. Um, as the Earth goes around the sun, the parallax effect would make a, a nearby object appear to move in an ellipse with a one-year period. Of course, we're moving with respect to objects in the Milky Way, and they're moving. And so you have essentially a proper motion for the object. And so that will drift, in this case, downward like that over time. And what you do is you add those two effects together, and this is what you're going to see, these little curlicue motions. Like each, each curlicue from, happens over one year. OK, so that's what we're trying to measure. I prefer to look at it in a different way. Um, I look at the angular offset vertically on this middle plot here as a function of time, I've given two years here, and separate it into the right ascension component and the declination component of the motion. And so let's just look at the right ascension component, the solid red line here. <coughs> it should go like that versus time. The drifting upward here is the proper motion in right ascension. And the sinusoidal effect is the parallax effect. Um, you can take out the proper motion very easily, especially if you sample carefully. And so you take this slope out, and you'd be left with data that looks like this. And this is what I like to look at. So in this example, uh, if we measured a data point up here, let's say in uh, March of 2008, came back six months later in September and put a couple points down here, and go back to March of 2009, essentially the, the difference of these offsets is twice the parallax. Okay, so I'm going to show you some real data now for this. So first let's look at the Pleiades. The Pleiades is kind of interesting. I mean, it's just beautiful to look at, easy to pick up in the sky. Uh, and being a cluster, it's very important for astrophysics for determining uh, Brightnesses, absolute brightnesses of, of stars and uh, ages of young, these are young stars, uh, luminosities, things like that. Um, everything was pretty well, people thought it was pretty well known that Pleiades was between 131 and 135 parsecs. And then Hipparchos, the satellite that measured all these parallaxes with milli arc second accuracy, threw a monkey wrench into this whole thing. And they came up with a distance of 120 parsecs with an uncertainty of about one and a half. So you can see that's a huge difference. This sparked an immense controversy that was going on for more than a decade. Um, the many astrophysicists were saying if the Aparcos result is right, all of stellar astrophysics is wrong. We don't know how stars work, <laughs> basically. And the Aparcos people were saying, look, this satellite works beautifully, it measures parallaxes with one milli arc second accuracy. Parallax is really straightforward. Uh, we can't be wrong. Okay, so a lot of people tried to do something about this. Uh, people tried to use the Hubble Space Telescope, use the fine guidance sensor to actually measure a parallax. And they measured three stars, 
And they got numbers of about 135 parsecs with a, about a three parsec uncertainty. That certainly supported this number and didn't support that number up there. In the meantime, we started observing several young, uh, about 10 young stars in the Pleiades that have radio emission, so we can observe them. And here's what we got. Here, for example, is one star's uh, motion, uh, parallax effect and right ascension and declination over here. Uh, the scale is from zero, one tick mark is five one thousandths of an arc second. The data points are shown there, and you, there are error bars on them, but you can't see them. They're too small to be seen. There might be one somewhere we can find. No. Okay, very small error bars. And one parameter, the parallax, describes both the right ascension curve and the declination curve. So when you get something like that, you know you have it right. We measured five stars here. We got the same answer, more or less, for all the stars. And we ended up with a distance to the Pleiades of 136.2 with an uncertainty of 1.2 parsecs. So we felt that this totally clearly showed that Arcos was wrong. This is totally independent measurement. I mean, all these others are optical measurements. This is a radio frequency measurement. Shares none of the same systemat systematics or, or problems. And our uncertainty here of one parsec, basically, is not measurement error. It's the fact that the Pleiades cluster has some depth. I mean, you see it has some angular extent on the sky. It's probably got the same extent in depth. And that's about a little over two parsecs deep. And so if you get a star in the back or in the front, it'll change its number a little bit, and it contributes to that scatter. So we, we average five stars to get that number. OK, um, let's go a little further in distance to another famous optical object, the, the Great Nebula in Orion. Ah, what accounts for the difference for? And would they screw up? <laughs> they, it's not known. Um, they claim it's impossible. Um, it's clearly they have an issue. The best bet is that they measured 50 stars in the Pleiades, and now they could only had uh, an accuracy of one milliarc second, which is at this distance is about a 15 percent uh, uncertainty. So for each star, they might have gotten, say, 120 plus or minus 13 or 15 parsecs. And if that were the answer, 120 plus or minus 15, put it, multiply that by 10, that would be consistent with, with the 130s. Okay, but averaging 50 stars together, you get the square root of 50 improvement in your accuracy. But you're assuming that all those measurements are independent. But there's no systematic effect that affects them all. And so the betting is there is some systematic effect. And, the, and it's basically, the, I think, the brightest field that Aparcos looked at, because there's so many bright stars in there. Why hasn't somebody gone back and like analyzed the five you did from the Aparcos data? You can't see those five in the Aparcos. Oh, OK. Let's see, our, these stars are a bit younger than many of the others, and they're still in, deeply embedded in dust. Oh, OK. Yeah. Can now, comment on that? Sure. Uh, the new Gaia release includes a Tycho Gaia yep. measuring a parallax, and those agree with the data that we find in the stacks, because as poor as our astrometry is in the stacks, over 100 years, our distances, uh, our, our proper motions and parallaxes agree with the, uh, with these. Uh, the older measurements. Yeah. Not the yeah, Gaia in the first data release got about 135 parsecs. Uh, with not, I think the error bar from Gaia was also about three parsecs or something like that. So the, the, the problem with Hipparchos is not known. And Gaia basically is the son of Hipparchos <laughs> on steroids. Um, and so it, it's interesting. The same people are working on that, but they, they don't want to. Do we call this fake data? <laughs> <laughs> they, they call ours fake data, yes. <laughs> Okay, let me move on to Orion. So the Orion Nebula Cluster, it also has a lot of these young stars that are, are weak but detectable radio emitters. And we did the same thing as we did in, in uh, for the Pleiades. Uh, here we measured the parallax of three stars, 
uh, a relatively unknown star up there called GMRA. Uh, one over here, GMRF. And this one actually is pretty well known. It's Theta 1A Orionis, but it's not the O star. It's a companion of it. It's, it's a, actually a triple system, I believe. And so it's a distant companion of uh, Theta 1A Orionis, one of the trapezium stars. What are you comparing parallax to at the nebula? Ah, so, so what we measure, yeah, I haven't said yet, what we measure is absolute parallaxes against background quasars. So we can detect a quasar at essentially infinite distance. Through the nebula? No, it, we could actually do it through the nebula, but it's, it's a, probably, if I remember correctly, about a degree and a half away in the sky. So it's, it's, it's offset by much more than this picture. This picture is uh, arc minutes across. That's about. It. So what's what's the scratch? In order to see the parallax, you got to compare it to something. Right. So we we observe the quasar, and then we observe the target, one of these stars. But in this picture, what are you observing against? Oh, well, that picture is just an optical picture for just for clarity. It's got nothing to do with okay. our measurements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you can't do this optically the way we do it. So what we do is we, we switch back and forth between the quasar and one of these stars, and then we make an image of one relative to the other and measure its position. I mean, to put it another way, we can only do this if we're within what is generally called the isoplanetic patch, which for optical observations is pretty <coughs> small, for radio it's many degrees. Because we're observing at a much longer wavelength. Okay, so. Here is the data, the parallax data for the Orion Nebula cluster for these three stars. This is the eastward right ascension offset versus time over a year and a half. There are three data points on here because we have three stars, all relative to the same quasar. And uh, there you can actually start to see the error bars. The scale is from here to here is two milli arc seconds. This is the declination effect, which is nearly zero where we sampled. We actually tried to sample it to get the big effect, which is the right ascension effect, and not the small effect, which is the declination. You just get a more accurate answer for that. But it's consistent with zero there. Uh, the parallax we get for the Orion Nebula is 2.4 milli arc seconds with a 2% uncertainty, 40 micro arc second uncertainty. So that tells us that the Orion Nebula is 414 parsecs away, plus or minus seven parsecs, two percent. So now you know how far, far away the Pleiades are and how far away the Orion Nebula are. Two of the nicest things to look at in the sky. Okay, so let's go out of the Milky Way now. Uh, it's a great picture from Easter Island of the Milky Way by Wally Kosoka. Um, and uh, everybody I'm sure who's in this room has seen the Milky Way at some dark site, I hope. Spectacular. Um, and what you see is, you know, a bright band of stars across the sky, a lot of dust absorption in there. And the question is, what does the Milky Way really look like? I mean, we're, we're living inside of it. It's a disk-like system, and it's very hard for us to know what that looks like. Uh, the analogy I like to give is if, if you have a pizza, and let's say you're a little piece of pepperoni lying in the middle of the pizza, what would your view look like? Would, would you know what the pizza was? <laughs> you would see something like this. Okay, so we can make guesses of what the Milky Way looks like. <clears throat> and here are two other galaxies that share properties that we think the Milky Way has. So this galaxy has got two spiral arms and a big bar across it. This galaxy has more spiral arms, a little more irregular structure, and not much of a bar in here. And we think if you, if you were to merge these two pictures in some way and mash them up together, you'd be pretty close to something like what the Milky Way looks like. But we really don't know, because we're living inside of it and you can't see very far in the Milky Way. And measuring distances on the scale of the Milky Way is very hard. So for example, I, I mentioned Hipparchos, uh, which could do 10% accuracy at 100 parsecs distance. If this were the Milky Way and if the sun were at that yellow dot, that's the 10% error circle for Hipparchos. 
Obviously, you can't do galactic structure with that accuracy. Uh, here's what Gaia hopes to be able to do. They hope to be able to get to 20 micro arc second parallaxes, maybe a little better. And this would give them a 10% error circle about like that. And now you can start to do galactic structure. Uh, of course, the Parkos can't look through the plane very far. They have to look above and below the plane because of dust extinction in the Milky Way. This is what we've actually been able to do. We've been able to make measurements as good as five micro arc seconds, more typically 20 micro arc second parallaxes. So this is roughly our 10% error circle if this were the Milky Way. And so what we do is we find a, a star forming region source like that bright spot there, <laughs> where some, in this galaxy, where some young star, massive star is formed, ionize the material around it, it glows in the blue, and those blue things trace out the spiral arms, you know, very clearly. And what we do is we measure the distance to one of those, and then we measure the distances to lots of them, and hope to trace, make a map of the Milky Way. Okay, so what are our targets here? No longer are we looking at the fairly weak signals you can get from a fairly young star which has magnetic activity on its surface for a few million years. We're going much further away. We need much brighter targets. And the targets we use are astronomical masers. Okay, and maser is like a laser, like this laser here. Uh, laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So it's an acronym. Just take the L off. In, in, la in light and laser, and you got a maser, and, and the M stands for microwave, that's centimeter wavelength radio. And how a maser works, and how this thing works that I'm holding here, is you've got to excite some atom or molecule to some high, higher state than it should be in normally. Uh, you send a, a photon in, a little bit of light in, and you will trigger it, or it's called uh, stimulated emission, you'll trigger the atom to, de to go down in energy level and make a new photon uh, that is ex an exact copy of the input photon. So you got two photons that are exact copies. And now if you did this again, you'd end up with four photons and then eight and 16. And very rapidly, you can get a very bright source with this cascade. And that's how this works. Now this laser pointer here, uh, you'd like a long path length through it to get a lot of amplification, to get a lot of photons. What they do in this thing is they put a mirror on each end, and the light bounces back and forth a lot of times before a little bit of it comes out a hole. Okay, in, in astrophysics, that you can't do that. You don't have mirrors. But you've got big clouds. <coughs> so if this is a, a very luminous star, and there are clouds of gas around there, and they're going to be trace constituents of things like water and methyl alcohol and other things, um, it turns out that uh, if, if this star is luminous enough, it can cause the molecules to end up in this excited state up here, and it can give you a, a maser-like signal. And basically, it's a one-pass amplifier, but this, these clouds are pretty big. They're you know, sort of an astronomical unit in size, distance from the Earth and the Sun. Um, as I said, trace constituents of water, for example, or methyl alcohol, and they get inverted, the, something happens to start the photon off, and you get a lot of photons out the other side. And it would look like these little yellow dots here, if you could see radio waves. Really bright, just like this pointer here. Very bright point sources of light. They're great astrometric targets. <coughs> and they're all around these very massive young stars. So we use these as a proxy for the star. Let me just show you a couple more measurements. This was actually our first uh, very accurate measurement to uh, a star forming region using methyl alcohol, that's CH3OH. So it's the alcohol you don't want to drink. Um, and here are the three plots. This is what it did over one year, went like that, relative to a background quasar. If we correct for proper motions and stuff, we get the plot on the right. And the solid line is the eastward motion versus time over one year, which is the parallax effect. And in this one, we also got the declination effect, too. The scale is pretty small here now. Uh, from here, major tick marks from here to here is now one half of 
one one thousandth of an arc second. Okay? And so that's this, you know, the, from here to here is twice the parallax. The parallax is about 0.5 milli arc seconds. The actual value is 0.512 with 10 micro arc seconds uncertainty, about 2% uncertainty. So this thing is at 2,000 or 1,950 parsecs with an uncertainty of uh, 40 parsecs. This was actually a, an interesting source because other measurements in astronomy had put it twice as far away, at four kiloparsecs. Okay, once we, we did this, we realized, well, we can actually measure parallaxes with this number all across the Milky Way. And so we started a big project. We sent a proposal into the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which runs the 10 element, very long baseline array that I showed you a picture of. And we said, boy, there are masers all over the Milky Way, let's measure them all. <laughs> okay, and so here are methyl alcohol masers. And um, these lines here are a very early model of the spiral arms in the Milky Way based on pulsar data. Um, so every dot there is a, is a region of massive star formation. Big stars are forming in there right now. And, uh, but the location of each dot is not very good because we had to use very indirect methods to, to locate them. And you can see, you can't see spiral arms in that data. These are water masers. Uh, they go a little further out in the galaxy than the methyl alcohol masers. Uh, very similar. Uh, I don't have the ones on this side of the plot because that's only visible from the southern hemisphere. So there wasn't a good survey of them in the Southern Hemisphere that I found for this. Okay, so we proposed to the National Observatory to spend 5,000 hours on their telescope over five years. And uh, the survey is called the Bessel Survey, or the Bar and Spiral Structure Legacy Survey, honoring Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel, who measured the first stellar parallax. And uh, we've been at this for about five years. Now, so we've actually finished the observations that we proposed to do. Uh, we've measured, we've published 100 uh, parallaxes to star forming regions. 100 more are just about uh, going to be published in the next few months. And we've got a few more that are much more distant that we're working on. Let me just show you two very distant ones, just to brag about the accuracy. <laughs> so this is water masers in a giant molecular cloud right near the galactic center, center of the Milky Way. It's called Sagittarius B2, that's its name. Uh, let's just look at this curve here. This is the right ascension offset versus time from parallax. And we have four points here, and uh, what, five up here, and three down here. And the scale's gotten even tinier now. Um, from here to here is, is a half of a milli arc second. This is about a tenth of a milli arc second. And so the, the parallax of this object is 90 micro arc seconds with an uncertainty of 7 micro arc seconds. So that translates to about 11 kiloparsec. Whoops, I went on to W. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that was too far. 129 micro arc seconds for SAG B2. That's a distance of about 7.8 kiloparsecs with about 10% uncertainty. That's actually a pretty good measurement of the distance to the galactic center, how far we are from the center of the Milky Way. But with 10% uncertainty, it's not really competitive anymore, as I'll mention in a few minutes. Uh, this is the, one of the most distant ones we had, we had measured up until about a year ago. It's uh, got a great name, W49, um, and then water masers again, and you can see the signature here. It's very clearly measured, and now from here to here is only one-tenth of a milli arc second. And so this is the 90 micro arc second parallax. Okay, so we've measured lots of them, about 170 on this plot. So this is a map or planned view of the Milky Way. This is the center of the Milky Way there at zero, zero. The sun is up here, if you can see that spot, a little red thing with a circle around it. Um, the scale is big. Uh, the distance between here and here is actually 8.3 thousand parsecs, 8, 8 kiloparsecs. 
Um, and every dot on this thing is a region of very massive star formation where it's going on right now. These are tracing the spiral arms. Uh, the arms are labeled as follows. This is called the outer arm, very aptly named. Uh, this one has been known for quite a while. It's called the Perseus spiral arm. It goes around like that. Uh, the blue points are what's called the local arm. So it actually has had many names. It's been called the Orion spur, the local spur, the local arm. Um, it was thought to be a, a fairly local thing. It's very close to the sun. We're almost in it. Um, and it was thought to be relatively insignificant. Uh, but you can see, just look at the numbers of those blue dots compared to the number of the black dots in the Perseus arm, which was thought to be one of the dominant arms in the Milky Way. So you can see there's about as much massive star formation going on in this local arm, whatever it is, compared to the Perseus arm. There were some, that, well, we go inward. This is called the, the Sagittarius Carina arm. This is called the Crux Scutum Centaurus arm there in Cyan. And then it gets messy as you get into the center of the Milky Way. Uh, this is supposed to indicate the bar in the center of the Milky Way. And there actually are thought to be maybe two bars. That's why I've diagrammed it like that. There were some interesting surprises. So the first surprise I mentioned is the local arm there, uh, which was much more, was much bigger than we thought, had a lot more star formation. There's a big gap in the Perseus arm here where there's, you know, well, there's one star forming region there, and this one probably belongs in there, but it's got a pretty big uncertainty. But there's very few star forming regions and over, you know, 8,000 parsecs here in the, in the Perseus arm. That was a surprise. And basically what happened is most of these blue dots here, uh, uh, we thought they were going to be in here. So for example, let's pick this one. So we'll look, start from the sun, go through that dot. We thought it'd be out here, but it ended up back there. And so did all these others. And so people really didn't have this, an idea that there was a big gap in that spiral arm because they thought all those sources were in the Perseus arm, but they're not. Okay. So let's just show you what you can do a little more with this. Um, now that we've sort of located where the spiral arms are in this part of the Milky Way, um, we can then go to catalogs of sources that we haven't measured. And there are thousands of sources in these catalogs of star formation. And we, we don't know, for example, the galactic coordinates, the galactic longitude and latitude, where it is in the galaxy. And we can measure the Doppler shift, the motion of uh, along the spiral arm. So we have the, this, this sort of coordinate, three-dimensional coordinate, all the way along each spiral arm from the parallax measurements. If we go into a catalog of a source that we haven't measured, if we can match up the longitude, latitude, and velocity to a piece of the spiral arm, we have a pretty good bet it's going to be in that arm. And so we can do a statistical approach, a probabilistic approach, of assigning distances to those catalog sources. And when we do it, it looks something like this. So now you see a lot more sources. And those are from these catalogs of star forming regions that match up with the parallax sources, basically. And our goal is to fill this out even more and then make a much more realistic, instead of a you know, colored dot picture of the Milky Way, that might look something more like this. And we've ended up there with an artist's conception of the Milky Way. We want to guide this artist's conception to make it totally realistic. So that, that's the main goal of our project. Let me just spend a couple minutes here in the end and uh, show you about some sort of um, dynamical information we get about the Milky Way. So first of all, we take all of our measurements together and we can pretty well get the distance between the sun and the center of the Milky Way to be 8,340 parsecs with an uncertainty of about 160 parsecs, about 2% uncertain. Or if you like light years, about 27,000 light years. Um, we also can measure the motion of the sun around the Milky Way, its orbit, and its circular component we're measuring to be 240 kilometers per second. That number I'm going to talk about in a minute. That's an important number. Basically, the faster objects go around the galaxy, the more massive the gal galaxy has to be to have that work. For example, 
the Earth goes around the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. If you made the sun four times as massive, then we would be moving twice as fast, the square root of four times, as fast around. So if we know how fast the Earth goes around the sun, we know how much mass is inside uh, our orbit. And that's really what we're measuring here. OK, 240 kilometers. Well, that's an interesting number. I'll come back to it in just a second. OK, so we can actually do better. We can take all of our sources, since we've measured the, what are the proper motions, the angular motions on the sky. We've measured Doppler shift motions along the line of sight. We know the distances to them, and we know their coordinates. We know all three dimensions of spatial information and three dimensions of velocity information. And so we can do a lot with that. So for example, here's just a schematic. Let's say here's the sun, here's the galactic center, and here is some massive star forming region where we've measured the parallax and proper motion. So we know its distance d. We've also measured the three dimensional velocity vector, which I'm showing here in blue. But that's in a heliocentric reference frame. It's reference to where we are observing here on the Earth around the sun. And we know the sun is moving at about 240 kilometers per second. And it's got a little extra component. It's not moving in a perfectly circular orbit. But it's got this 20 kilometer per second, what it's called peculiar motion, non-circular. So we have to add these two up. That's been subtracted because we're in a heliocentric frame. If we want to go to a galactocentric frame, what you'd measure if you were at the galactic center, we have to add those two vectors back to this vector. So you add them, pretty simple, and you get the motion you would see relative to a frame, reference frame in the galactic center. So we can calculate the circular component of, every, of velocity of every source we measure, very simply. And when we do that, we get this plot. It's called a rotation curve in astronomy. And uh, basically what I'm plotting here is rotation speed, zero up to here's 250 kilometers per second. And here's distance from the galactic center, zero, 5,000 parsecs, 10,000, 15,000 parsecs. And you can see, uh, at least from about oh, four or five kiloparsecs outward, it's a pretty flat curve. And it goes down as you go in toward the center. Okay, so this uh, is, I think, the best rotation curve that exists for the Milky Way. Uh, it's directly measured. It's based on three-dimensional motions. Most other rotation curves are based on one component of the motion, the Doppler shift along the line of sight. And this is based on gold standard distances, parallax distances. Okay, let's compare this rotation curve for the Milky Way, which is flat, pretty flat there, from about four kiloparsecs out at about 240 kilometers per second speed. And that's what this blue line is. So that's what we've measured in the Milky Way. Here's Andromeda, M31. Now you can measure a an external galaxy pretty easily. You know, it's sitting up there in the sky to see. And uh, so you measure, it's tilted a bit, yet you have to know the tilt of the galaxy and you measure Doppler shifts. And that's uh, not a hard thing to do. This was done with uh, 21 centimeter hydrogen emission radio emission from atomic hydrogen. And you can see these red squares go like this. And, you know, qualitatively, it's pretty close in rotation speed. It's pretty flat at about 240 or so kilometers per second, matching the Milky Way pretty well. Uh, this green point is a different measurement. I don't want to have to, it's an independent measurement we've made. Uh, I don't have time to go into that. If you want, you can ask me about it. But this is what the International Astronomical Union had suggested we use, 220 kilometers per second. You can see that's clearly wrong. And actually, this makes a big difference going from here to here uh, when you want to calculate the amount of enclosed mass that would support that rotation. So you're implying Milky Way as massive? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not good. Yes. <laughs> yes, in fact, that's what I'm going to end on here. So. Here's the Andromeda galaxy, M31. This is what people sort of thought the Milky Way looked like. You know, an artist's conception, smaller, the little sister of the Andromeda uh, galaxy. But given their rotation curves are very similar, I think that's the, the better picture. Yay, we're number one. <laughs> we're more like you know, fraternal twins than big sis, little sis. 
think what I'm going to say here. Yes. Okay. Well, when we first published these results, actually, we only had 18 objects when we first did this, and uh, but it, it's held up now with 200. Um, it made it. It was at an American Astronomical Society meeting. Uh, that was in Long Beach, I think, and uh, it got a lot of press coverage. Now, usually, when you give a, a you know a press release for some result in astronomy. It may end up on the 40th page of some local newspaper and little thing, you know. This one caught on because it was kind of simple and, and understandable. And it, it made, you know, every big newspaper and finally the New York Times. And following that, it made uh, the Colbert Report. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play you a clip here if I can get the volume up here. I could answer questions if you want. Yes. 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 Well, the lights. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Your slide. Hey. All right. Is it technology great? Uh, should I feel them? Uh, let me start back there and work work this way. Okay. Is are is there any interest or are there any plans to do a long base telescope in the southern hemisphere? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the question is, are we planning to do this in the southern hemisphere to fill out that map? And, yes. I'm now going twice a year to Tasmania, which is a great place to visit. And they have an array of telescopes. You need a lot of time and a lot of telescopes to do this, thousands of hours. And so they have an array that's run out of the University of Tasmania that has a telescope in Tasmania, just south of Melbourne, one in Western Australia in a town called Yarragardi, one in Northern Australia in a town called Catherine, south of Darwin, and one in Seduna, which is sort of west of Adelaide. So it spans all of the continent there. And so you know, we've been working for a few years to upgrade the equipment there to do this, and we hope to start observing in a few months. Okay. Since the Milky Way has such a pronounced bar into it, is the mass distribution? Sorry, is the mass what? Is the mass distribution different based on? Yeah, probably. I mean, um, the two galaxies are not identical twins in by any means. Right. But I mean, do we have more mass in the center and less in the arms? Yeah, I don't know. Um, my guess is we have more in the arms than Andromeda and less in the center. Andromeda's got a bigger bite. Yeah, Andromeda's got a really big bulge. And much less star formation going on in the arms than in the Milky Way. First of all, the suggestion that the easiest answer is if you have NASA put up a pole of satellites so that you just watch this as it's going. Yeah. So always fascinated me the difference between the way meteorologists look at things and the way astronomers shouldn't be as much different as it is because basically what meteorologists are doing is taking the multi-body gravitational problem and saying it isn't a gravitational problem at all. It's merely a problem in fluid dynamics. Merely. <laughs> I, don't use, I use the same thing that I get, get back. Okay. If that if that were the case, and I think it should be, it easily can be looked at like this. The one thing that you would find is that this is very much like looks like the spiral bands and hurricanes and almost anything. In other words, once you get a rotating, differentially heated fluid, you always get things like this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. the. the uh, almost to, to preordain mm -hmm. that you will end up with sheer bad, sheer zones in it, and it will always produce waves of one kind or another, which the bands are in fact waves. Probably. Yes. Waves in a fluid. Okay. Now, if you carry the analogy a little further, I might as well carry it all the way, <laughs> because I've listened to this other side of it for so long. What you would find is that these things that you call spiral bands and the little knots and so forth, that they would be, first of all, constantly changing. Yes. And secondly, the motions within the uh, say pockets of okay. things, the arms, right, however you would, how would you describe that, 
would be quite different from what the overall rotation of the, right. the galaxy would be. Right. And so when you talk about the rotation, you may, you're talking about <coughs> one kind of rotation, which isn't what we would think about. If we had this picture, NASA has the picture, you would see a different, you would get a different number. I'm not criticizing. Probably, no, probably you would. But there's a difference between, there's a pattern, like for the spiral, which, which is constantly changing. Which at probably is constantly changing. But the original theories, dating back to the 1960s, were, 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 there was a pattern, and the stars and gas moved into this pattern, got bent a little bit, and stayed in it a little longer, and then left it. So they're, they're basically orbiting at the, uh, at the speeds I was talking, but the pattern would be much slower. But no meteor meteorologist would ever have agreed to that. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't think that pic the thought, I don't think that picture is right. Okay, there's been a lot of numerical simulations of rotating disks in, in like galaxies, and it, the, what's coming out of the numerical calculations is that spiral arms are pretty transitory, um, and that even though I had diagrams of some pretty long arms here, let me see if I can get one. Let's go back to real stuff like that. That they're probably made up of segments. A segment like this, and then a segment like this, and that they sort of form and hook up for a while and then fall apart and things form. And that's the best bet these days, that they're transient. Yes, but a point I want to make the additional one is that the motions yes. that you mentioned, that you're taking one specific kind of motion, yes. and there's all okay. kinds of motions right. which are at variance with that one. That's right. No, no. Again, I'm not criticizing. No, no, no. I agree. And there are wave motions and there are physical motions. For example, if you're out in the ocean and there are some waves and you're floating and a wave comes by, you'll just go up and down. That's all that's going to happen, even though the wave is coming past you. And so uh, what we are measuring is true orbital motions gravitational orbits. How this pattern presents itself is quite, could be quite different. And that's what I think you were saying, right? That's a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're saying it as an astronomer, so it's okay. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Let them go. Okay. So, yeah. Kelly? so Mark, the, the, what you're mapping here are these um, uh, hot young stars. Yeah. Uh, and they sort of find visibly what we see as the orbit. How, how does that compare to what you think the actual true distribution of mass is within the disk of the galaxy? Yeah, spiral arms are probably, in terms of density contrast from mostly stars, very insignificant changes, 5%, 3%. So if you were to add up all the stars and, smooth and measure a density across here, this would just be the very peaks of the thing, and, and everything else would be, the peaks wouldn't be up very high, a few percent higher than the background. Well, they're more luminous because there's a lot of blue stars there. Yeah, yeah really the young really stars. Hot. Young, and they die fast. That's right. These stars live only 5 million years or 10 million years. Right. Um, and basically, we think the stars form in spiral arms because of hydromagnetic shocks that compress the gas to, to cause the stars to form. As the waves pass through. As the waves pass through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Linen shoe density. Hmm? Linen shoe density. <laughs> well, linen shoe density wave is, is sort of a global one. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be right from, from numerical simulations, now that we can do the calculations, which I, I don't do. Okay. okay. We'll have one more question, then I'll close the meeting. Right. <laughs> you will get, for sure, yeah. different <laughs> rotational speeds in the center, yes. you'll get on the other side, and there'll be all kinds of different, I guess I'm not complaining, it's just you gave the impression that there's a rotational rate, and there isn't. Uh, well, no, there is if you go far enough out. Where, where is the second? There. There's the rotation curve. If you're out at about four or five kiloparsecs from the center, everything seems to rotate at about the same speed, and that's seen in all spiral galaxies. No, no, I'm not disagreeing right. with that. As you go to the center. Yeah. No, what I'm saying is <laughs> that there is not a rotational speed for the galaxy. No, there true. is a rotational yeah. speed for parts of it and a different rotational yeah. speed for other parts of it, namely going towards the center. Yeah, yeah. As you, as you go inward, it, it, it's quite different. Yeah. 
Grant? No problem. Okay. <laughs> All right, I want to thank Dr. Reed for coming. Point the next month's meeting. Uh, our meeting is now adjourned. Have a safe trip back.